Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Ben, and this is another edition of Fresh Red Kills. So Fresh Red Kills are the videos where I talk about the books that I have recently finished reading. And this one's coming kind of late. Uh, it's been a while since I've made one of these. I'm going to be talking about three books that are all, I mean, I guess they're all horror related in one way or another, um, that I read in February. Um, I haven't made any update videos regarding February, so I'm trying to get to that now, even though it's the first week of March. But whatever, better late than never. Uh, so let us begin. In the beginning of February, um, I did this with a, a group read, actually, um, and we read The King in Yellow by Robert W. Chambers. I had been on a journey the last few years to read older Gothic works from the um, 18th and 19th century, and this was really the last one that was on my list. Now, there were some that I skipped, uh, some that I will, I'm sure, eventually go back to, but this year I am mostly going to be focusing on 20th century horror. Um, uh, I think in the second half of the year I'll probably get to some of the early 20th century, you know, I don't know if I want to call them masters, but certainly the more influential writers. Um, but in the meantime, I've been looking at some uh, mid to late 20th century, starting with, I got Stephen King's The Stand that um, I'm working on currently. That's that book that's on its back right there. So this is the last one that I really had on my list for 19th century, again, at least for now. So Robert W. Chambers, an American, I believe he was born in New York. Uh, he did, however, go to school in Paris um, as an art student, the Academy of Beaux Arts, and he was a pretty decent illustrator. But it seems like afterwards, he very quickly sort of abandoned illustration and became a writer, full-time writer. He published this collection of short stories, The King in Yellow, in 1895. And it's a kind of curious work. It's certainly incredibly influential, uh, especially to um, certain writers like H.P. Lovecraft. And, I mean, I can kind of, I can kind of see why. Um, it is a weird, um, it's an odd little book. Uh, it is a short story collection, but it is not consistently themed. Yes, it's called The King in Yellow, and there is something that we can, uh, that is referred to as The King in Yellow in here, but really only in the first few stories. Um, the first couple of stories are sort of horror slash weird fiction, and then after that, each story gets progressively more and more ordinary, mundane, quotidian, um, and in my opinion, just not quite as interesting. So the first four stories deal with The King in Yellow, which is this play, it's a drama, uh, that apparently when people read it, it can drive them insane. Really cool uh, premise. And the four stories uh, that begin this are kind of connected by this, this book that seems to be, you know, somewhere in the background. We hear people picking it up, reading it, seeing it on the shelves. I will say I was taken off guard a little bit uh, by this, the first story, which is called The, um, the Repairer of Reputations. The book opens up in 1920. Um, again, this was published in 1895. And it opens up in like this sort of uh, future United States, at least 1920. Um, and it's like this, uh, this autocratic sort of fascist future, uh, which is really interesting. And there have been um, like suicide chambers set up <laughs> in cities. People just go and kill themselves. Uh, all of the power has been concentrated in the chief executive. Uh, it's it's a weird future, and I wasn't expecting this. I, I didn't realize that that story was going to take place in, like, this, again, this dystopian future. Uh, and it paints a really fascinating world. Now, I don't know if the world is the point. The thing is about that first story, it seems like the story is doing a lot. So it kind of introduces this the, this future dystopia, but at the same time, we have this central character who is following uh, this sort of deformed, insane person who is called the repairer of reputations, at least that's what he calls him, and our narrator is convinced that he is basically in line uh, of royalty, and there are certain people that he has to do away with. I don't want to, I'm trying to get spoilery here. Um, but he is obsessed himself with uh, with power and attaining power and keeping power. So I wasn't sure if there was a thematic connection between this power obsessiveness and this sort of fascist 1920s. 
Uh, it's difficult, I think, to see the connection between <laughs> our kind of central story and the setting in which it takes place. It's interesting, certainly. Um, I don't know if it's entirely cohesive or if that was just me reaching for some way to, you know, draw those two together. But I like that first story. The second story is The Mask. Uh, it's kind of a weird um, pseudo-scientific story, which I liked overall. I think it could have had a, a darker ending considering the way these other stories go. The next one was The Court of Dragons, I believe, which um, was um, very kind of Edgar Allan Poe-esque, I would say. Not bad, but uh, nothing nothing great. The fourth story I think was the strongest. It was The Yellow Sign. And we, we have a very memorable, I think, vision of this guy standing outside what's well, basically an apartment building. I think he's almost like a, a graveyard um, night watchman or something. If I could be remembering that wrong. It's Again, I read this in early February. It is now early March. Uh, but the way that the narrator describes him, he's basically like a rotting corpse that is constantly looking at him and staring at him. And I, I love that. Um, I thought that, was, that story was actually really strong. After that, we leave horror behind. And it gets a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> we have uh, the, I don't know how to say this, uh, the Demoiselle de Is. It's like a time travel story. Um, we have the Street of the Four Winds uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, that was like a dark little macabre story. And then The Street of the First Shell, which is actually historical fiction, uh, where we go back to the Siege of Paris in the mid-19th century. And then, sorry, that is uh, The Street of Our Lady of the Fields. And then the final story was Rue Barre. Uh, now, as I said earlier, the stories kind of get less interesting as they go, and they start to fall into the same theme over and over again. Um, now, I had mentioned that Chambers was uh, an, an American student in Paris for a while, uh, learning learning illustration at the Academy of Beaux-Arts. And you can tell that when he was there, he kind of fell in love with, with Paris. And when he returns to the U.S., he seems to like rewrite that sort of theme over and over again, because we have a the same thing happen again, over and over again, in these later stories, where essentially... An American, uh, it's it's American expats simping for French girls. Uh, now, whether it is a an American going back in time and falling with a French girl, or it is an American, uh, you know, in Paris under siege falling in love with a French girl, if it is American, <laughs> uh, lots lots of times these are also American artists um, who are in France. Uh, it's just over and over again, it's the same thing of them falling in love with French girls. Uh, so it's, you know, you read one of the stories, you kind of figure out what's going to happen in all the others. So I can't, honestly, I wouldn't recommend this entire collection. I do think that the first four stories are worth checking out. And especially, if nothing else, I would say reading The Repair of Reputations and um, The Yellow Sign. Those two stories should be read, and I think they should be read back to back. Those two stories appear to actually take place in that same dystopian future. I'm not so sure about the other two that are in between, but at least those two seem to take place in the same world. And uh, those are pretty strong. So interesting. I like a lot of the ideas here, but like I said, it's uh, it really loses steam um, as it goes. It's not a very long collection either. I wish there was more cohesion as far as theme or tone in this. I was also, in February, reading this, this collection. Um, I actually began this, I think, in January, but I finished it in February. I wasn't, like, racing through it. I was taking my time. Uh, you can see all the different things that I marked up. These are all poems. Um, so this is Death Poems. Sorry if I keep taking this out of the frame. Uh, classic, contemporary, witty, serious, tear-jerking, wise, profound, angry, funny, spiritual, atheistic, uncertain, personal, political, mythic, earthy, and only occasionally morbid. I had found this at, sorry for the glare, a, uh, one of my local bookstores a while back, and, um, I wouldn't necessarily call myself morbid, but I, I am a, a horror fan. I've said this in the past videos, and, uh, one of the ways that I like to understand horror better is to sort of confront the fear of death. Um, I admit that I am somebody who has a fear of death. Um, you know, I don't think there's anything after, but uh, I think that it is perfectly rational for a conscious being to fear.
fear its consciousness no longer existing. Not that I would understand it, but you know, especially being a husband and a father, um, I worry about what comes, you know, for my family after. Uh, so I feel like confronting death uh, or confronting a fear of death is something that I kind of repeat over and over again. And maybe that's partly the appeal of, of the horror genre for me. Uh, but I think it's also one of the things that draws me to poetry, um, for people to find ways to succinctly address or approach uh, some, you know, very difficult topics. Uh, so this really interested me, and it's edited by Russ Kick. Um, he was um, somebody who was known for using the Freedom of Information Act um, as like a kind of a transparency activist uh, inside the, uh, in the U.S. Um, those uh, you know, might remember the uh, controversy about the U.S. government not allowing pictures of coffins, of flag draped coffins coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And he is one of the people who used the Freedom, Freedom, um, Freedom of Information Act, uh, I, I believe if I'm remembering this correctly, to um, get photos published of that sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, he, he is somebody who was wanting more government trans transparency. And he edited quite a few things, um, and he died a few years ago. Uh, I don't think that his death cause was released immediately. I think his sister said something about him being sick for a long time. But anyhow, he has now actually passed. And I gotta say, I do like his taste in poetry. Um, I am somebody who likes poetry, but I don't always like a lot of the poems that I read. <laughs> uh, I don't really like a lot of modern poetry. Um, I prefer things a little more traditional. Uh, I like a little more, you know, um, you know, give me some rhyming, give me some meter, uh, give me that sort of thing. And thankfully, it seems like Kick also likes that. So the overwhelming majority of poets, poets in here are from either the U.S. or from Europe. Um, most of them are men, but there are quite a few women in here. Uh, this is not the kind of poetry collection that is forcing diversity, necessarily. Um, and there are certain poets that are uh, frequently shown. They, they reappear over and over again. Um, Emily Dickinson keeps popping up. Uh, Sarah Teasdale, I think, was another one that you see over and over again. And what's nice is, you know, some of these poets I knew, but a lot of them I didn't really know. So this is a nice introduction to them. Um, that Sarah Teasdale that I mentioned, I realized that I don't really like her stuff that much, because <laughs> every time one of them came up, I didn't really feel it. Uh, but for, I like Dickens, uh, Dickinson, sorry, but it's, uh, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna pick up some more Emily Dickinson. I've read her some of her stuff before, but I've never just gone through a collection. So I think I'll do that. And what was also nice is the way that these poets, these poems are shown, it's like you just have the title and the name. There's no context otherwise, except uh, he organizes them basically by theme. So that's what you're doing. You're, you're looking at different themes um, throughout. Uh, their poems are collected that way. But because I don't know the biography of the person or anything like that, um, I'm reading this stuff with a lot, of, a lot of context. So I might come across a poet or a poem that I was really interested in and I wanted to learn more about the poet. And to my surprise, the poet had died like 500 years ago. I didn't realize how old that poet was. And it led me down all these rabbit holes too when you start realizing or reading about these really fascinating lives. So it gave me a lot of people actually to look further into, which I was really happy about. And I would say that, you know, maybe at least half the poems in here I thought were really good. Uh, there were certainly some that I'm like, eh, didn't really think that much of. But you can see that all these tabs were poems that, you know, uh, struck a chord with me or that I really liked or that, you know, I kept thinking about afterwards. I don't know what I'm going to do as far as these tabs being on here. Um, I am considering maybe just filming just reading some of these poems and uh, and posting them. I don't know if there's going to be interest in that. I don't always make decisions based on what people are interested in seeing. I kind of just make decisions about whatever I feel like doing. So if I feel like doing that, uh, you might start seeing just death poems popping up. Um, <laughs> if you're not into them, you can certainly ignore them. Uh, but they will be very mercifully short videos, um, just in case you do feel like checking them out. Uh, but if there is an interest, you can let me know in the comments. If there isn't, I might do it anyway. But uh, anyhow, I did like this connection, this collection. And if you like poems uh, in the style of like the 19th century, or early 20th century especially, I think that you would probably enjoy this as well. And again, it's it does say only occasionally morbid, and that is true. These is, this is not a morbid collection necessarily. It's more of a contemplative uh, 
Although there is a little bit of humor, which is nice too. And lastly, all these things have sort of horror or dark uh, connotations to them. So I also read um, Horror Film, A Critical Introduction. So this is by Murray Leader. I have read various introductions to the horror film, and usually they leave me wanting. Uh, sometimes they are just glorified lists of films. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes the film analysis can get a little bit too Freudian, which I'm not too interested in. I prefer my historical horror film analysis to focus on like historical context. Uh, my dog's barking. I think my wife's home. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I want to look at a a film as a historical artifact, as a cultural, as material culture. And, you know, what can I, what can I see about the time period through that film? And I will say, Murray Leader, uh, I think he writes a very good introduction to the horror film in this. Um, again, it's called A Critical Introduction. So really, he's not necessarily introducing the horror film. He is introducing horror film uh, scholarship. That's really what he's doing. And he is giving us themes and, um, oh my God, my dog will not stop barking because my wife has not gotten out of the car yet, apparently. Uh, oh, I think she stopped now. Good. Um, he is giving us context for the ways that scholars have, um, have looked at the horror film. And what's nice is that it's kind of like a general introduction each, each section, but he's also giving us a lot of the scholars that we can look to to further um, our understanding if we're interested in that sort of thing. So he splits the book up largely into three sections. The first section is a general history of the horror film. And that's some of the stuff that I'm really interested in because that's where he looks at the historical context of the different historical films. Again, he doesn't go in depth necessarily. He's introducing us to ideas and scholars that have um, looked at that. So it gives you a whole bunch of names and works to look at. There's a pretty extensive um, bibliography back here. Uh, so, which is nice because, you know, horror film scholarship can be a little bit tricky uh, to navigate. Um, and some of the works are unfortunately very expensive as well because they're all these kind of niche academic presses. The second section, uh, the section of the third, goes into uh, a little more philosophical um, this is where we get maybe a little more Freudian analysis. There is what is horror, uh, why horror, uh, you know, what, what maybe what purpose does it serve? And then what was the other one? Um, looking at horror audiences and critics and why do people look at it? So again, he is introducing us to different theories, different studies that have occurred and offering us names and works that we can look into further if that's what we're interested in. And lastly, he's looking at a little bit more the um, the form of the horror film as uh, cinematic art. So he looks at the way sound, this uh, chapter is called Shocking and Spooky Sounds, the way that sound is used in horror films, the way color is used in horror films is the next chapter, and then finally, uh, digital horror films, the way that digital medium has affected uh, horror. So uh, I really like this. Um, I thought it was really solid. I only have one little gripe, uh, and he's not the only one that's done it. I've seen it before, but um, a couple times he refers to the Conjuring films as Blumhouse productions uh, when they're not, but that's okay. I can get past that. Um, otherwise, I think that he does a really good job of offering a, again, a critical introduction to the horror film, not just a general introduction. Uh, so if you are somebody who wants to look further into horror studies, you know, and read more scholarship, this is a really good place to start, I would say. Uh, to, you know, uh, become more acquainted with some of the conversations that are going on or have gone on and the names attached to them. Um, and I've read some other things by Murray Leader. They have one on the back here, the uh, yeah, the Modern Supernatural and the Beginnings of Cinema. I've read that. Um, really interesting stuff in there. And he also edited a really good collection uh, called uh, Cinematic Ghosts, um, which was a good collection of uh, essays about, you know, um, horror and ghosts in cinema, obviously. Uh, but yeah, uh, I like this. I, I'm glad that I read it. So those are the three books that I read, or at least, yeah, there's two others that I'm going to make a separate video about, but these are three that I read in February. So once again, I got The King in Yellow by Robert W. Chambers. We got Death Poems, edited by Russ Kick. And finally, 
horror film, A Critical Introduction by uh, Murray Leader. If you've read any of these, love to hear your thoughts. And as always, thank you, BookTube.